All right. Let's get started, guys. Hi. How are you? <laughs> Good. Anybody uh, not see the eclipse yesterday? I think that's going to be an easier question. No one? <laughs> Is it the first time that you guys see this? Cool, cool, cool. For me, it's my second time. The first one was in Algeria like 20 years ago or something like this, 22. So uh, yeah, <laughs> it was pretty cool. Um, hopefully, it's going to happen again because uh, I like seeing this kind of stuff, you know. Uh, usually you're used to one thing, but then when you see it change like that, it's pretty, it's pretty interesting. Um, another example of these kind of events is if you're living on the uh, International Space Station. The day and night change every 90 minutes, uh, so that's another weird thing kind of. But anyways, so some uh, updates for uh, the course. The last updates you're going to get probably, so focus. <laughs> uh, Maybe I'll make a cute speech at the end, you know? <laughs> so for the people that are taking the exam uh, with me for the 19th of April. So the room, Ellen, type. <laughs> the room for the, final, for the final exam for those that are doing it on the 19th is SP457.03. And it's going to be at 2 p.m. Um, make sure you go to the washroom, make sure that you eat, make sure that you do everything because I'm going to be alone invigilating that exam. So that means no one is leaving. If you leave, you don't come back, okay? And I have another student that is coming from another class, <coughs> so I can't move at all, okay? So make sure that you have your pencil, you have your uh, approved calculator, and, uh, and that's it. Easy? Yep. 2 p.m. to 5 p.m. Yeah. Where do we get our The bookstore, I believe. Yeah. Yeah. Like, do you have something to sit down? Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Especially you guys. Actually, them, I could, you know, avoid that. But you, I'm not the one invigilating. It's going to be people that are from the university. So they have one rule to follow is the sticker. Yeah, 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 I'll be there. It's just they're invigilating and answering questions, OK? For the others, the rooms remain the same. Uh, I think you have it on your schedule online. Um, I'll send a final, exam about, uh, fi final email about this. Uh, same rules apply to you. The only difference is that you guys are doing it on the 23rd from 9 to 12. Uh, still f bring your pencil and uh, calculator that's approved and all that, OK? What else did I want to say? Today's lecture is more of, yeah? Yeah. I mean, uh, I don't know. I've always, like when I was taking the exams here, they always told me the stickers, so now I'm just repeating the same thing. But uh, you know what? I'll verify about this sticker thing and send you an email if it's like a problem or not. But it's better to have it from now on and then just do your whole degree with it, right? So it doesn't really change if it's in my class or another person's class. Yeah? I, uh, I will send uh, the cheat sheet um, in the next days so that you can practice with it. So it's just a list of formulas that you can use. But I'll be making the sheet. Make sense? What else? Um, so the quiz is going to be tomorrow, online again. Okay. Uh, there were many people that were talking about the uh, the eclipse, but it was more of a skip the quiz than <laughs> than the eclipse itself. Okay. But anyways, it's okay. <laughs> uh, so the quiz will be online, like we did for the last one. The one that we did last time, I will post the grades today, uh, so you can review the quiz and all that. Uh, what else? What else did I want to say? So you have one, you have no more tutorials left except for those that have tutorial tomorrow. But uh, the other is that's it. And then there is only if a last set of problems uh, that I posted online. So today's lecture is not is not on the final. And listen carefully here because I don't want you to tell me you said this. A lot of the things that we learned today, we already learned about. 
So sa Sanger sequencing, you know, fluorescent probes, all that. So just a repetition. The only difference is that it's giving you a context where these things are applied and telling you kind of about the history of genomics and all that, which is going to be interesting for later on in your degree. Obviously, um, if we already talked about the stuff in here in the past, they're on the exam, otherwise, no, okay? The last set of problems, you're gonna have to do it by yourself at home. Uh, you can compare with the solutions. So I posted that. Actually, let me go on Moodle. And this is just because we moved a lot of things this semester. I'll be also posting your current final grade uh, so that you have an idea of how hard you need to study. <laughs> um, what else? And uh, also uh, the report from the bonus assignment. Just one second, let me do this. I did this thing like five times in the past 10 minutes, man. It's crazy. Uh, what did I want to say? So I'll be posting also a report for who, di who studied how, like without the names, obviously, so that you know what A people are doing and uh, D people are doing, and then you know, compare with that and try to study better. So if you didn't do the assignment, it's this one here. Just fill it out. If you didn't do the other assignment, but you were present, don't forget to post the other assignment, the bonus one, because I see that there's, what, 24 people, I think? Oh, 30, not bad. Okay. There's maybe, like, uh, 20 missing, I think, from the list I have of attendance. And then we have, we have, we have this last set of practice problems. These are R in the final, okay? So these practice them at home, do look at the solutions, and, um, and then... And then if you have questions about those, send me an email or to your TAs. Here, it was just a message to tell you that the lecture that we're doing today uh, is not really on the exam, except for the stuff that we saw previously that's included in this lecture, okay? And I think that's pretty much it for the updates. Yeah, one, one more. Yeah, go ahead. <laughs> As soon as possible. <laughs> it's been like a month, you know. <laughs> oh no, no, this is the the this one here, so that people can have an idea, yeah. like at least two weeks before the final, right? Um, Nicholas, did you had a question? No. Pretty much, yeah. Yes, Mary. Yeah, I can do that. Yeah, I can do that. Um, what else? Final exam. Seventy percent is from midterm to now. Thirty percent is from beginning of the semester to the midterm. So that's about fourteen questions, if I'm not wrong, from the beginning, and then the rest are. Um, from the end. Cool. Um, most of it is problem solving. There's a few theoretical questions, and that's it. That's yeah. Yeah. Okay. Lecture. That's it. So today we're going to see some cool stuff about genomics and genomes. This is one of the fields that I actually like. Some people, you know, um, like this, others don't. But this field has a lot of uses and gives you the opportunity to kind of really play with life, let's say. Um, and so I'm going to give you a few examples of projects that were run uh, by amazing people. And then you'll see how they use the knowledge of just how the DNA looks like to building kind of um, big stuff, OK? So one of the biggest challenges that we had for uh, as biologists is to actually sequence the human genome. Because when you sequence the human genome, you know what it's made of. So we used to work without knowing really what it is made of, right? And try to f figure out without having the sequence. But if you have the sequence, then you have actually the components and you can study them more in depth, right? So the first project that tried to uh, do this is the Human Genome Project. And it started about at the same time where, you know, all the computer stuff uh, started appearing, and then the dot-com bubble, which appeared in about 
year 2000, so it's close to that time where Silicon Valley was kind of exploding at that time. And the goal was just to sequence the 3 billion base pairs. Well, they didn't know at that time, but now we know, of the human genome. And so the main goal was to kind of understand human disease. And there were about 2,000 researchers that were involved. Right now, to do this, you need only one scientist uh, and uh, one small machine this big, right? So you can see how it has evolved uh, like uh, compared to, to, to that time. And this is the lab that where they sequenced the human genome. Okay, This is crazy, right? With a big lab like this right now, you can do a lot of things. Okay. Um, this year, uh, if you're religious, uh, I'm sorry if you're not. <laughs> it's just, uh, you know, the sentence, uh, weird sentences that come upon uh, the news talking about how now we can do God's job, but, you know, um, it depends if you're a believer or not. <laughs> but uh, we can at least have an idea of the makings of uh, humans without too much, you know, acting like God or whatever. Okay. So the director of this project was uh, Francis Collins. Don't need to call him doctor anymore because we're both doctors. <laughs> and uh, he discovered the main genes that are linked to uh, diseases in uh, f like cystic fibrosis, Huntington's, and Duchenne muscular dystrophy. To do this in your career, it's crazy, okay? It's not like a small thing. He just hit three diseases at the same time, okay? And at that time, right before they sequenced the human genome, there were only 500 human genes that were sequenced, and there we have about 20,000. So there was no way at that pace that we we're going to get to this. We would probably still be closer to like 2,000 genes right now that are sequenced. Okay. And so this project came in and kind of fixed all those problems. So at that time, the only way we were working at looking at DNA is by looking at cDNA libraries. And if you remember, cDNA is the complementary DNA, which comes from the mRNA. And so this is interesting because you can use it to study gene expression across time and disease state, but you cannot really have an idea about the genomic side of, um, of our cells. And what I mean by that is the cDNA does not have the introns, right? Does, it's missing a lot of things that are interesting, right? And so this was not a best way to do this. And it didn't tell you anything about promoters, terminators, splice sites, and, you know, the introns or intergenic sequences. And these are very important as we are realizing now, uh, especially promoters and terminators, right? But all the others also. And so we had to find a new way to do this. And so the first technology break before starting to sequence the DNA was the discovery of cDNA and the ability to convert this RNA molecule into DNA. Um, but this was not sufficient because it did not represent the genomic DNA itself. And so we needed kind of new ways to do this. And that's where the Human Genome Project so, uh, came. So how do you, how do you sequence a genome that you have no idea uh, what it is. So the way this works, right, is instead of going from the mRNA, you, you'll use the gDNA or genomic DNA. And the way this works is that you cut it into smaller pieces, right, and then you stick to it. So I'll just give you like the zoom in idea about this. You stick to it adapters at the end, right? And that allows you to bind a, pr uh, a primer on the other side of the adapter, right? And so this kind of adapter gives you the basis that then the polymerase can come and walk on, right? Because if you don't know the sequence and you cut it, you still don't know the sequence. So you don't know where to put the primer, right? So instead, you stick the adapter and then get that polymerase uh, to go on it, OK? And so this is an example of shotgun sequencing because you basically just throw things in it. and. Uh, uh, sequence at random, right? And shotgun is just used as a kind of uh, alluding to how, you know, when you shoot with a shotgun, it just goes everywhere. So it's kind of the same thing. Um, and so you end up with these sequences here that overlap. And uh, we've seen the mechanism for uh, sequencing in this sense. We'll look at it again in a second. But it will give you these libraries here that look like this. And then using bioinformatics, you can see how you can kind of uh, overlap them and then create these contigs, right? 
Um, and these contexts, then you can stick them together, again, using bioinformatics, and you can get the sequence of DNA. Right? Easy? So this we've, we've seen in chapter, uh, I forgot what chapter it is, but uh, 10? Yeah, I think it was 10. So this is the technique they used. It's the same that we learned. They're using these dideoxynucleotides. And so what they do is that they will create four different test tubes. And each one in it, they will add a s uh, specific dideoxy, right? And then they will just do sequencing at random. And this dideoxy will create these fragments of different DNA fragments of different lengths. And then you, know, you can put that on a gel and uh, kind of figure out the sequence of DNA. So the old school way of doing it is by putting everything into f a gel in four different wells for each of the different reactions, and then just reading the gel from bottom to top, and that will tell you what is the sequence of your uh, DNA fragment. So a few things to remember. The test tubes have everything the same except for the dideoxynucleotides. They're different. That's the first thing. And uh, the DNA, you start reading from bottom to top because bottom is the smallest DNA molecule. It travels much faster than the others. And so you can see that this is the smallest. So it would be T, C, G, A, et cetera. Okay. So this is the old ghetto way of doing it. Okay. The new way of doing it, you use fluorescent probes, which will, instead of you reading the gel like this, um, you would kind of use fluorescent molecules that would emit a light at a certain wavelength. And by emitting the light at a certain wavelength, every time there is a new base pair added with that uh, specific uh, wavelength, it will send a signal to the computer, which then just uh, reads the sequence. Okay? They still use gels, but these gels are kind of capillary gels. They're very small gels. You don't need something like this big. These gels used to be like this big. Okay? Um, and so, so that's the thing. And then the fluorescence is much easier to measure uh, with the computer, right? So, so this is basically the evolution. Um, you see this here. This is a whole gel. And then imagine for 3 billion base pairs. If you remember the lecture about Dylan there, uh, it's about 9,600 pages or something. So you can imagine how, why you would need 2,000 scientists and like 11 years to do this, OK? Um, and so the gels used to be big like this. And this probably gives you like 100 base pairs or something like this. So that's crazy, OK? And then uh, the Human Genome Project came in and added some automation to this using this old uh, NASA-looking computers here. <laughs> and then all this room here at the end was turned into this uh, sequencer here, right? And so these ones here are not as expensive as this whole thing here. And they allow for a much high, higher throughput um, sequencing using just a small machine like this. So this has evolved like big time. The cool guys. So this is one of the coolest scientists uh, in our field, Craig Venter. Who already heard about Craig Venter? OK, so I'll tell you about this guy. This guy is playing God, basically. <laughs> He's trying to rebuild stuff uh, from just chemical reactions. OK, so Craig Venter. Um, and his buddy Francis Collins, which I talked about earlier, founded a biotech company called Celera Genomics in 1998. And um, they decided that they were going to finish the human genome in four years. Okay? So that's while the human genome project was running. So he's basically telling the government, I'm going to let you do like eight years of research and then come in and do it in four, and that's it. Okay? And he used these automated sequencer, uh, gene sequencers, which I showed you right here. So it's just, you don't need this guy anymore. Well, you do, but not as many of this guy, right? Uh, because you have the computers helping you to sequence. That's why it's called automated gene sequencers. So his way was as follows. This is how he actually won the race to sequencing the genome. He used shotgun sequencing, which we learned about, combined with the automated sequencers. But he also used something called EST tags. So sequencing, you can do in a random fashion by doing this shotgun sequencing, right? But mapping the genes is another story. So how do you map the genes on a sequence that is random? Because sometimes you'll have ATG, right, which is your start codon. But it doesn't mean that it's the start of a gene. 
because methionine, the, the um, amino acid, is also used in proteins. And so you don't know if you're starting here or there or there. So what he did, he used these EST tags that he developed in his own lab. And these tags are, uh, EST is short for express or expressed sequence tags. And it's a way of just annotating the genome. So what you do is that you kind of replicate, uh, so you'll first reverse transcribe the cDNA, and then you will, um, you will kind of just do a PCR reaction, and it will give you these short tags here, right, based on the genes. And you know that cDNA does not contain the introns. It contains the exons, which is the protein coding part of DNA. And so, and genes are what? Protein coding, right? And so what he did is that he took the sequence that he found from the uh, shotgun sequencing, overlaid it with this EST technology, and it gives you the location of all the genes that produce proteins in the cells. Um, yeah, this is just a diagram saying that the more information you have, the more expensive it is, but pretty useless. <laughs> Um, and so with this, now we have the full genome with all the genes in it, even though we don't know most of them what they do. Uh, but we still know where they are because we take the mRNA, convert it to uh, cDNA, and then um, we can map it then. So I know I showed you this at the beginning of the semester, but I will show you again. So any genome... Uh, they talk about this in your book if you ever end up reading the other chapters, but um, if you find, so if you want to look at any genome like that exists, usually they are posted, no, not usually, they get posted here first, and so you can look at the genome of any organism that you want, even COVID if you are interested, okay? So they get sequenced, they get put in here, and then you can see all the genes for, um, on the DNA, right? And then you can play with this. It's kind of ugly as a system, but if you learn it, it's pretty interesting. Cool. So that's that. Shit, I feel like I'm going super fast, but it's okay. <laughs> uh, what else? So this is not the end um, for genome sequencing. In 2000, uh, Bill Clinton and Tony Blair uh, decided that the human genome should be available to everyone, and this has kind of boosted research by a lot, because if you keep it for yourself, uh, then what's going to happen is that everyone has to sequence the genome on their side, and this is just almost impossible, right? Um, and this is the paper, if you want to read it and see how research used to be done. Uh, so this is the paper where the human genome was sequenced, and then, you know, another paper that's also interesting. The reason why there are papers right now, it's because when you get to second and third year biology, all you're going to do is read papers. There's no more textbook. You, you know the textbook. <laughs> okay? So get used to reading these uh, articles because it's part of what you're doing right now. So the, the company that takes care of genome sequencing right now the most is Illumina. And uh, they announced that they are trying to take the genome um, genomics outside of the lab, so making everyone able to um, sequence the genome for just 200 bucks, and they're trying to do it, well, that was before, now they're trying to do it for 100 bucks. Um, and this is kind of interesting because you can use this now to do whatever you want. Uh, you don't necessarily need, well, it's better to go with a company, but you can still do it by yourself, right? Just extracting the stuff is very easy to do. And you can see how in 20 years, a technology that costed $300 million ended up just costing 200 bucks. And um, I guess it's going to be even cheaper in the future, unless, uh, I don't know, it should be good. So how are they going to achieve this? <laughs> because now we're like trying to reduce the cost by a lot, right? So there are two techniques that are being used right now. M the first one is a little bit old but still being used. So this is called sequencing by synthesis, which is similar to Sanger sequencing. The only difference is that you don't need the huge computers there. Uh, what happens is that you will take your DNA molecule, break it into different fragments, right? Add these adapters, which you know the sequence of, because you're not always just sequencing something that you know, right? 
uh, sometimes, most of the time, you don't know what you're looking at and you're trying to figure it out. So you need at least some sort of sequence that you know, which is this adapter here. And then to the adapter, you attach it to these chambers here. So this little rectangle here is one of these small spots here. Okay. So you will cut the DNA, you'll add the adapters, and you'll stick the molecules like this. And what happens is that when you stick them like this, and you run some electric current through it, they will attach into a U shape like this, forming this bridge. And then DNA will be synthesized from this end to this end right here, right? And then you open them back again, release the reverse strand, and then repeat the process, OK? This allows for multiplexing, which means that you can run many different sequences at the same time. Um, and uh, it takes very little space, as you can see, just this small chip here. Obviously, they use these fluorescent probes, which are just the nucleotides but emit, that emit colors. So they have kind of a fluorescent molecule attached to them. And then you run this a number of different cycles. Right? And each time, a letter will be kind of uh, fluorescing. And that will tell you what sequence it is. Clear? Easy? OK. So the advantage about this is that first you have to amplify your libraries or your initial set of uh, molecules. So then you can be really confident in your sequence. And uh, it reads at uh, 30 times faster per nucleotide compared to before. The problem with it, it only sequences small fragments like this. And so you can imagine for a 3 billion uh, base pair genome, this is kind of not the best technique to do. But if you're sequencing some small stuff like plasmids or whatever, this is pretty interesting, actually. And also, when you're running, um, so in the DNA, you have these repeats, right? So if you read the book, they're called microsatellites. But if you didn't read the book, just they're repeats of, um, of DNA, AT, 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 whatever. So these can get lost because they happen at many places in the genome. Uh, but they're only read once. So you feel like you, you think that that's where your repeat is happening when you're running this instead of at a later place. So you would only see it at one place because you're having these small fragments, right? And so if two fragments have that repeat and you read those two fragments at the same time, you will think that there is only one repeat in it and not two. Solution for this, you do long read sequencing, <laughs> which is another technology uh, to sequence DNA. And this one here, um, you can read up to 25 KB on average, but maximum that has been reported is 134 kilo basis, so 130,000 base pairs. And uh, in this case, because there are long repeats, then you have the chance of capturing the whole repeat, uh, long reads. So you can capture the, the repeats uh, more easily, right? So there are two technologies that exist. I'll just show you one today. Nanopore, this is the one that we use currently. So you'll hear this a lot in the lab. Um, the way this works is that there is this synthetic machinery here that looks kind of like a cell machinery. You have a membrane in here. You have a nanopore protein and a motor protein. And what they do is that they act as a helicase Right? So the motor protein acts as a helicase and moves the DNA through the pore. The pore here makes sure to stab stabilize the DNA molecule right here. And there's this small protein here that's doing that job. And then as the nucleotides go in one by one, um, there is an electric signal that is sent to the computer based on the nucleotide that is passing through. And this is super precise. So this was engineered by people. It's not like uh, it exists in, uh, in people, OK? Um, and so these go in one by one. And every time one goes, um, there's a signal that is kind of emitted to the computer because there's an electrical change between here and here, OK? And PacBio is something else, but similar, similar concepts. And you can read those changes like this. It produces a graph like this. This is some cool stuff, very cool stuff. <laughs> OK. Nice. We're going to finish early. I like this. <laughs> uh, 
so for genomics, now what's the purpose of genomics? You can do a lot of things with it, okay? I'll give you just three examples of what you can do with it, but it's pretty much anything you want in terms of biology because if you have the DNA code, you can play with it and change the whole uh, genome if you want, and we'll see examples where this was done. So there's this guy here called Svant Pavel, I can't pronounce his name, but uh, what he did is that he used genomics to compare the genomes of humans and Neanderthals, okay? And uh, this was, I guess, obtained, the DNA from uh, them was obtained from a bone, and you can see how we evolved compared to, uh, to them, okay? And he got the Nobel Prize in Medicine in 2022, you probably heard about him. Um, I think now he's trying to sequence the genome of a mammoth or something like this. Um, not sure, but anyways. And so the way this happens is through something called homologs. So you probably heard about this. Species and organisms have similar genes, right? The more distance, the less similarity you have between uh, you and the other organism. And so you can compare those similarities to see who's the oldest organism, who's the newest, and uh, which ones resemble more to each other. So you do this by looking at homologs. So homologs is just a term that says two things are alike, and then this term can be divided into two different categories. Orthologs, right, are, um, just imagine it as comparing between different organisms right? And paralogs is by comparing with different species of the same uh, organism, okay? This is going to be easier for you. This is one of those terms like the, that keeps changing between books and all that. Uh, it's like uh, the coding strand and the template strand and all that. This is a similar concept, highly problematic, but remember that orthologs are between different organisms. Paralogs parallel, maybe that's going to help you, same organism, but different species, and homologs is just an umbrella term for these two, okay? So if you, f if you do this and you look, for example, at the Neon Neanderthal, that's easier to pronounce, and uh, <laughs> humans, uh, you can see what genes they had, what genes they didn't have, and then you can kind of model the way they looked like, uh, even though we do know, but it's not 100% perfect and you can figure out what diseases they could have at that time, et cetera, okay? Did they have cancer, for example, or not? Is this something new that came up, um, et cetera? And uh, you can also measure the distance of time between two different organisms by using this. And um, it's not 100% perfect, but it takes into account the mutation rate, um, uh, things like this, um, similarities between DNA sequences and all that. And you can see when two organisms diverged uh, from a common ancestor, right? So this is called a phylogenetic tree. You've probably seen this before. And this is the tool that's used to show that. And you can see how each organism uh, compares to the other. One example where uh, the textbooks talks about these uh, mammalians that can produce eggs. So this is the only mammalian that produces eggs. It's these monotremes here. Um, and so to put it on this phylogenetic tree here, it's important to kind of look at these things to see if it's closer to a chicken or not, <laughs> right? And that gives you insights on what type of uh, organism it is, when did it appear, and all that. And so these guys are the only ones that produce the yolk protein, which is necessary for eggs. It's called, uh, their version of it is called vitellogenin, right? And it's not present in the other mammals, only in monotremes. And this gives them the, oppor the, the possibility to have eggs just like birds. And you can see on this clade here, or this tree here, that they're closer, they're close to, to, to birds. And it's not for uh, no reason, okay? So what does this look like in terms of genetics? Okay, so if you take these monotremes, uh, well, let's take a look at chickens, for example. So they have three different genes that code the yolk protein, right? And then if you compare them to the monotremes, they have only one gene, and humans, they don't. They have these pseudo genes, which are just the replacement of these yolk genes, okay? And you can see that because they have one copy that is similar, 
then probably they are closer to the chicken than to humans. Okay. Obviously, you do this for all the genes after sequencing it, and it will tell you what clade it's closer to. Okay. Evolutionary biologists like to use the principle of parsimony, which is the simplest explanation possible, which is not always the best explanation, because life is pretty complex in terms of biology, and so using this kind of way of explaining it is not perfect, but there are other models that evolutionary biologists use. right? This is just one example of them, which in this case translates to, well, they have one copy of the genes, the humans don't, so this must be closer to this. Okay. Um, so that's one example. Additionally, you can compare and look at human evolution by looking at different populations, right? So um, you can see uh, how uh, different groups have migrated in the world. Uh, for example, if you take the Af um, hu humans that are of African descent, uh, they move to these regions, which are called the Denisovan region and the N-word region there, <laughs> Neanderthal, whatever. And, uh, and so when they went there, they mated with these groups and kind of changed the genomics of the, <laughs> of the uh, populations, okay? And uh, if you follow these kind of changes, you can figure out uh, who comes from where. Um, for example, all people that are of non-African ancestry um, have a 1 to 4 percent Neanderthal uh, ancestry. Okay. Um, who has done the 23andMe test? Anybody? You? <laughs> so you're from Colombia, right? Venezuela. And did you find something weird in there? No? <laughs> kind of. <laughs> Okay, so um, there's people uh, that I know that did these tests and uh, you know they find weird things but if you retrace it through history you'll see that it makes sense, okay? Um, what else? What else? What else? What else? So the sequence of the Neander Neanderthal, damn this word. <laughs> it, it's easier in French, you know? So. Um, uh, what did I want to say? So it's posted online. You can go read this book here, which is a science paper, if I'm not wrong. Um, and you can see the sequence uh, here. You can even find it in the, actually, this is a good point. Let me, let me see if, uh, I never thought about this, but you know what? Let's check it out. <laughs> uh, species. Okay, I guess it's not not there. Well, I was hoping it was there, but it's not there currently. Um, anyways, yep. With a T, with an H. Okay, I'll send them a request. <laughs> uh, anyways, so that's that. And then you can even, um, actually not you can even, you can see when different groups have originated. Uh, so based on the migration patterns and all that. And so you can compare their DNA and see uh, where different groups have originated. Okay. Um, and you can kind of uh, go through time and look at this. So these are two articles you can read. Um, this one is pretty interesting. This one didn't read it, but it gives you an example of how research is now used to look at, you know, species that don't exist, or not species, but yeah, species that don't exist, um, like this one here. <laughs> um, the other example where you can use genomics is functional genomics, and functional genomics basically tells you. Um, helps you understand the function of proteins and DNA. And uh, this is a big umbrella term that contains a lot of different techniques. We'll be looking at one of them, which is RNA sequencing. Um, so genome-wide RNA sequencing. And I'll tell you why this is relevant uh, for diseases, for example, etc. So RNA, your DNA, you have only, you know, one copy 
and uh, of each chromosome, right? And so for you to determine the level of expression of different proteins, you have to look at the mRNA or the proteins. Now, mRNA is a, uh, proteins are a bit expensive to work with, so cheaper way is by looking at the RNA. And so there's this technique called RNA sequencing, um, which is similar to DNA sequencing, but what you do is you will extract the RNA of your organism of interest. The way you do this is by extracting the poly A tail MR, uh, RNA, because this is some, something different compared to the other types of RNA, right? You don't want ribosomal RNA or things like this. And so you'll use a tag just to extract the poly A RNAs, okay? You will convert it to cDNA, and then uh, you'll fragment it and put it into, um, add an adapter, all that, and then you'll just put it into an Illumina library to sequence it. And this will give you the sequence and the amount of cDNA that you have. And so then you can map the amount of cDNA to the place on the chromosome. And this will tell you what gene um, is expressed more than the others. Does that make sense? Good. Why is this useful? So you can use this to quantify gene expression, right? And um, this is interesting because when you're looking at diseases, you want to figure out how two different states are, um, how two different states uh, are affected. And so you look at the healthy one, the, the diseased one, and then you want to find the signature of the diseased one so you understand what has went wrong, right? Is it the levels of protein? Is it a mutation? What is it? And so you use RNA sequencing for this. Um, and then this whole thing here is called transcriptomics because it includes the RNA sequencing, but also the, you know, uh, which genes it is, uh, the amount of the expression of those genes, right? There are other variations of these omics, so genomics, proteomics, redoxomics, lipidomics, etc. okay? Any molecule you can sequence or get the sequence of through kind of uh, a method is called omics. You'll probably be learning about proteomics and metabolomics um, in biochemistry. These are used right now to, so imagine you have two cells, one healthy, one diseased, and then you put them through a mass spec. It tells you what protein is messed up and what's not messed up. And so you start with a smaller portion of proteins to work with, um, and then it, it can even give you the mutation where it is happening, right? So if there's a mutation in a gene, you can find that mutation and then play with it. Cool? One example where this is used is uh, the Cancer Genome Atlas. So you can Google this and look at it, and you'll see, you'll see what mutations um, so you'll see what mutations are found in different cancers, and uh, you can uh, see what genes are overexpressed or underexpressed in uh, different cancers. And this is a good start, for example, when you're doing research on cancer. You, most of the time you will start here because you're interested in knowing for your specific cancer what's affected and what's not. And then from there, you'll go on and replicate that in the lab to try whatever you want to try, right? This is, uh, for example, in my case, uh, the three mutations where the three mutations in the protein that I am interested in were found by a group in France. Um, and this group in France sequenced, um, what do you call it, tumors from uh, breast cancer patients. And they saw that that gene was altered. And so now I am reproducing those mutations in a laboratory setting and trying to treat it with different things, okay? So this is how genomics uh, is interesting. You can also use it to determine biomarkers. So just an example for cancer. To diagnose cancer, it's not simple, OK? Uh, depending on which cancer you have, you'll have a lot of tests, OK? So blood test is the first part, but you'll also have biopsies. And biopsies are a big problem because they're surgeries, like small surgeries. And depending where it is, you can't even do a biopsy, right? Um, and so you have also these CT scans, and so it's a lot, a lot of uh, things to do to get the diagnosis. And you need a lot of people to get involved into this process, right? It's not just one person, it's someone that takes care of the microscope, looking at your sample, the blood guy, 
et cetera, and goes on, right? An easier way to do this is by looking for biomarkers in the blood. And usually what happens, or any, any sample, but usually the blood is the best, and this is called a liquid biopsy. So you will just get blood from the person, and then you can look for specific molecules or you know, RNA, whatever, that, it, that seems to have changed from the healthy state to that state. One of the companies that I wanted to build is to avoid all this problem here, uh, which is using um, these liquid biopsies to compare the blood of a person that is healthy with a person that has cancer, um, whichever cancer it is, and then it would be able to tell you that by just sequencing everything that's in there and also looking at the level of different proteins, okay? And then using AI to compare the two data sets with a healthy and diseased state. This way, humans, um, so humans are good at finding stuff, but not as good as the computer, right? And so if you're able to let the computer do that, uh, it can see, because if you're looking at 20,000 different molecules, trust me, it's hard to make a pattern out of it. So the computer is better at doing this. So imagine if you were, no promotion, the company is not running. <laughs> the, imagine if you could uh, just take a blood sample and figure out exactly which cancer it is, and um, as well as the stage location and all that. And this is actually possible just a few years um, away. So that's that. If you have some computer skills, get onto this. It's a good thing. Um, what else? What else, what else, what else? This also allowed for uh, splicing variants to be found between genes. So you can map the different exons by looking at the cDNA, and then you can find different versions of the same gene um, by doing this. So you can see how this happens. Um, and usually different transcripts um, produce, of the same gene produce different proteins, and they have sometimes totally different <coughs> functions or locations. For example, if this is a nuclear localization signal, well, uh, because this guy has it and this guy has it, they'll go to the nucleus, but not this one here, okay? What else? Synthetic genomes. This is the cool stuff. So there's people now that are trying to rebuild organisms from scratch. And they're trying to do this by creating, so the guy that did this is Venter, the same guy that we saw uh, earlier, Craig Venter. And so they're trying to go step by step. The first step they took was taking a bacteria um, and uh, trying to remove gene by gene to see um, what's the minimum number of genes that you need to survive. When you have all those genes, then it's going to tell you what is necessary for life, kind of, right? Because a lot of it is, oh shit, a lot of it is redundant, okay? <laughs> and uh, so you don't need most of it. Yeah, so this, he actually succeeded in doing this. The second thing he tried to do, he recoded E. coli to use different amino acids that are synthetic and not uh, happening in nature, okay? So he took this mycoplasma bacterium and just started removing gene by gene and uh, seeing if it lives or not. And he arrived to 473 genes, if I'm not wrong, yeah, 473 genes that are essential and the rest is pretty much useless, right? Why would you do this? Uh, <laughs> Because, as I said, first you need, he's trying to figure out if some genes are important or not, and that will tell you what's necessary for life. And second, he's trying to remove what we call the bloatware, so you have like the, the extra stuff that you don't need, so that you can start designing organisms from scratch and uh, using them for specific purposes. So Dylan that you saw, um, he's building something like this, but from an organism that exists, right? Because now, if you look at different reactions in the cell, for example, you wanna make, I don't know, an anesthetic from uh, a waste product. Technically, you can do this at the lab by extracting the different chemicals and then adding some other chemicals until you get to your anesthetic, right? He's trying to do the same thing, but in cells. So you would create kind of a network of reactions and then those reactions will take you from one product, uh, from one substrate to your final product. So you can imagine now how you can make any molecule that you want by finding the right pattern of genes. And so 
what he's doing is transforming one lipid that is useless to another that is um, very useful that you can then sell. But there are people that are making like super long chain reactions. And the way you do this is by getting the genes from other species and adding a promoter to them, modifying the promoter so that, let's say the first reaction happens, right? then this product will be used as an activator for the next promoter, et cetera. Right? And then you can start playing with cells like this and pretty much do anything. Okay? Sounds very fancy, but it's actually very hard to do in the lab because um, the genes that you insert are always reacting with other stuff. Uh, so you have to make sure um, that it works. Yep. Not introns, also genes that are useless. Because some genes, you have like 11 copies of them. So they're useless. And even if you remove them, the cell is not affected. It will still live. So that's the bloatware, the genes that are non-essential. Any redundancy? Redundancy or gene that does not contribute to being alive. Okay. Yeah. Like for us, we have 20,000 genes, but that's probably like one-tenth of the genome. Okay. So wh what is the rest? Like you could technically remove most of our genes and would still be okay. So this is the same thing here. Um, yeah, so that's that. What else? Oh yeah, recording the E. coli. So I also created these different uh, codons. Yeah, he, he also uh, created these different codons that produce uh, synthetic um, synthetic amino acids, so amino acids that don't exist in nature. And he tried to make the E. coli still live with that. Um, he took these serine codons and replaced them with other different, co uh, other different codons. And so what happens is that he was able to remove three, I think, um, three amino acids and recoded some of them. I don't remember exactly the numbers, but the idea is that he changed the codons needed for those cells. And uh, these are called non-canonical amino acids. And so he created them. The problem is that there's no tRNA to bring them, right? So he started modifying the tRNA as well uh, so that you would have tRNAs that would recognize a certain codon, but put your own amino acid that you want. And he was able to do this. Um, yeah, he was able to do this. Now, why is this interesting? It's interesting because now it gives the cell new properties and it's those new properties, like these uh, amino acids, can interact with different materials, right? And so you can then use them to uh, play with stuff that usually would not work with the regular amino acids. Um, imagine you make your own amino acid that interacts with a certain, I don't know, uh, polymer and use it to modify that polymer or, or whatever. So we, chemistry used to be the old way of doing things. Now everything is moving towards uh, biology and how we can engineer cells to do the job of a person. Uh, there's even these computer processors that are being built with uh, cells. So this is some crazy advanced stuff. But uh, genomics is very important in this sense. There are also people studying d DNA just to figure out how to put a lot of information in a small space. Uh, because the properties of DNA are very interesting. The last thing I think that I want to talk about, I'm not sure, but um, is personal genomics. So personal genomics is what we just talked about. You can also use genomics to fit, have an insights about your health, ancestry, athletics, etc. And all they do is take your saliva and then analyze it and compare it to other people. Now obviously, they don't do this with your whole genome because that would be 3 billion base pairs that are sequenced. Us humans, we are 99.9% .9 genetically similar. So what they do is that they focus on these, this 0.1% difference. And this is interesting enough for, you, for, for them to tell you about your, you know, uh, what you're made of. And these signal, signal, uh, single nucleotide polymorphisms, um, as we learned before, is what they look for because usually the gene, the complete gene, is the same. You just have places along that gene that change. Um, and this is the stuff they look at. Okay. 
One good example where these single nucleotide polymorphisms are used is to determine if you're going to respond to painkillers or not. So analgesics um, have different effect on people, right? And one uh, example of this is that if you have just the wrong SNP, uh, it can actually kill you. That so they have to take a look at your DNA. Um, if you have a different mutation, then it's going to be um, you, you need to use lower doses or it has a faster reaction, uh, faster time or whatever. And so this is something that um, is used to determine your, the effect of analgesics on you. Okay. You can imagine if you have this third example here, then the doctor could technically kill you just by giving you the same amount as someone else. So these things, that's why you need a specialist for this. And you can get these in the report for 23andMe and it will tell you all this.